Welcome back. I'm excited for tonight. Uh, tonight really is special because it's a kind of an intro into the gifts. So if you've been a part of the church, you understand that each person has gifts and we have talents and we have abilities. And so this is kind of an introduction into gifts and preferences and abilities. And then also we're going to be stepping into that further. But tonight's spiritual formation, for those of you who are new, here's a little bit of a spark notes to kind of catch you up. Spiritual formation is a process that we are all undergoing, whether we recognize it or not. It's, it used to be that you would ask somebody, are you a disciple? And that was, you were a disciple of the church. But now in our, you know, in our modern age, it's who or what are you a disciple of? Because we are all being formed into the image and likeness of something that we put our attention, our adoration, and our worship into. So spiritual formation in a biblical perspective is us allowing the Holy Spirit to form and transform our life into the image and likeness of Christ. Now, we often make many attempts at that, right? We have devotionals that we pick up. We have, you know, downloading all kinds of, you know, worship music. We step into extra prayer nights, extra worship nights. So that way we can encounter the Lord or encounter His presence or grow in our faith and mature in our community. But as we step into this, this series, we realize that what does that bring about? Yes, it's healthy disciplines. Yes, it's healthy spiritual habits. But as we've talked about, getting our order of our faith right is imperative. We must understand both being and doing and how they work together. So as we've kind of talked about that, that paradigm shift brings about a lot of nuances. And hopefully as you're sticking with us, you're kind of looking into this, the text, you're looking into what we're talking about, and hopefully the Spirit has enlightened you on what that means. But essentially, if you're new, what we like to... Um, what I like to reference in, in, in spiritual formation, I haven't done it too much in this series, is really the, the story about Mary and Martha, right? Martha is busy preparing for the Lord as, as the Lord comes into her house. And Mary is the one who's just kind of laid back, probably like the younger sibling complex. Somebody else is going to do it. And she's sitting there at the feet of the Father. And Jesus compliments Mary. And he says, Martha, you're focused on too many things. You're distracted, and you really should be prioritizing me and sitting in my presence. And so that's exactly what spiritual formation is. It's sitting in the presence of the Lord and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us. So, kind of got everybody caught up. And so on a little bit of a lighter note, let me introduce a question to everybody. Now, when I say the word journey, what comes to mind? I think that for me, uh, when I say the word journey, it might bring maybe a thought that you can relate to of traveling five hours to visit family on holidays. Maybe for you, it's a camping trip or a hunting trip or a fishing trip with your friends. Maybe it brings back good memories, bad memories, or maybe even in a more broader perspective, maybe you kind of even think about the journey of life that we're all on. You've heard of sayings like, life is a marathon, not a sprint. Right? And that's very, very true. There's a lot of truth in that idiom. But I think there's other idioms that capture what life is in respect to a journey. It's a bumpy road, or on the home stretch, or maybe even taking a pit stop. All of us, these are idioms that we might be familiar with, that we might have heard, or maybe even heading in the right direction. Now, all of these, as I said, demonstrate the journey of navigating life. Now, we all have mental maps. And those mental maps help us perceive not only our surroundings, but also make it in life. That's how we navigate life, how our parents have instructed us, how our teachers instructed us, how our mentors instructed us. And they've given us these mental maps to graduate high school, to go to college, to get married, to find a husband, to find a wife, to retire, to travel the U.S. in an RV. All of these, as simple as they might be, are mental maps on how we complete life successfully. Now, we have mental maps that might have been construed by our own personal interests or even by, you know, Scripture and what Scripture teaches us. But what we've sat down to do is we've sat down to challenge the ideas that we have in our head. We all have mental maps of reality that guide us. And this is why Jesus came to show us that the kingdom of God was not a distant hope to hope in or to provide a mental map for us, but a present reality for us, the church to live out of. 
And not only to just to live out of and kind of hoard it and keep the doors closed and check off who's going to be coming in and out, but to open the doors and allow people in, to invite others into the fold. And that's why Jesus says at the start of this verse, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, why? Because we're inviting others. Or in Luke 17, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. People aren't going to be out there saying, see, it's right there, or it's over here. He says, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within us. So what does that kind of mean? Well, life has a way of bringing us traumas or triumphs. And whatever season you might be in, it might be festivals or failures. But behind the scene, behind the curtain, behind it all, there is a steady kingdom becoming more and more present each and every day. And so as we are formed into the image and likeness of Christ, it's then that we're brought into this awareness, right? Maybe you're past that awareness stage and you've stepped into more of a new relationship or a deep depth of wholeness in your relationship with Christ. But there's a lot of things that Christ did while he walked the earth. But one of the things that he really did well was usher in the kingdom of God. We've talked about this in kind of like a technical Bible term. It's the inaugurated eschatology that Jesus inaugurated, kind of like a political term. The eschatology, the coming of Christ, the, the kingdom of God. And so he steps onto the scene, the scene and establishes the kingdom values that it can be found not only in heaven, but also now can be found established here on earth. He establishes kingdom values and kingdom virtues. One of the kingdom values that I've kind of been studying in this process is the value of, or the virtue of doing everything, counting others as more important to you, as more important than you, and doing everything not out of selfish ambition, ambition, but rather to count others' interests as more important. And I believe that this is like a pivotal, pivotal part of spiritual formation. You cannot talk about spiritual formation. Josh kind of alluded to this. He taught on this service to others. But in, when we're referencing gifts, it's pivotal to understand why we serve others. So whereas most neo-pagan, secular kind of thought would influence us to do better for yourself or better your own self, the biblical principles, the biblical values from the kingdom of God are rather turned upside down in our perspective. But everything that we do in the kingdom of God is right side up, and it's our flesh that is mitigating against the kingdom of God that we have to subjugate to the kingdom values. So whereas the world says, do better for yourself, the kingdom of God says, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Count the interests of others more than yourself. Serve others before you serve yourself. Now, I don't know about you. I'm the type of person that's like, there's food. I want to hop in line and get my food. So that way I ensure that I eat. So that way nobody takes too much and then I don't get any food. But, but that's not only leader, a leadership principle to correct that, but that's a kingdom value to correct that, to allow others, their interests to be priority over your own interests. So we endeavor in spiritual formation, not for ourselves, like the world would say, nor do we do it to ourselves. As we've kind of alluded to and talked about, it's something that we allow God to do. It's not that we're taking a back seat, letting the Holy Spirit drive, and enjoying the process. It's an active part participation in this, but we allow God to do in us and for us spiritual transformation or working out salvation, allowing grace to prevail in our life. But before we get lost in a separate teaching, let me get back to the notes and talk about what we focused on, which is gifts and talents. So if there is a kingdom, there must be a king. And if there is a king, there must be people to rule and reign over. And if there's a people group, then there must be a nation. So we are the nation of Israel. A lot of the times you'll see it in scripture, the nation of Israel or the people of God, chosen people, right? There's a holy covenant with God and his chosen people. Now we are on the latter end, so we are Gentiles. Not many of us, probably most of us are not Jewish descent, but we have been grafted into the nation of God. And not only are we grafted into the nation of God through grace, but we are called citizens of heaven, which means that we have a little bit of perks, but it also means that we are to call to be of a certain caliber, if you will, a certain uh, echelon, if you will, a certain type of people. Now, we, as we've kind of uncovered in different series, we, we talked about how Israel 
was, was the avenue of God's blessing in the world. So God created the world through and then and, and blessed Adam and Eve to, to be fruitful and multiply. Of course, they failed. Adam, the first Adam failed, but the second Adam succeeded. But in Genesis, God promises Abraham the lineage of, of, of Jesus soon to come later on. But he promised that there would be a blessing and it would come through the nation of Israel. Ultimately, that was Jesus, but that's the story of Genesis. So we've been grafted into Genesis. The Old Testament is relevant. It's not that we read just the New Testament. We dive into all of the text. So what's beautiful about this, and I, and I kind of have a, uh, I guess a, I'm notorious for saying this all the time, but the beauty in this is that God has not called us to be bench warmers or bystanders, but he's called us to be active participants in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that is an ever-present reality in our midst that dwells within us, we are called to participate in the mission of God, which is, it's, it's incredible. He's called us not only citizens of heaven, not only children, but ambassadors for his name. Now, I have a funny story on this. Uh, it's a recent story, and I was invited to a luncheon yesterday, uh, at, you know, in the... Uh, in the morning. And so I'm headed out to this luncheon. I'm checking the uh, address. I put in the address and I head to where I should be. I get there, I'm strolling in, and I remember that my wife reminded me that I need to register for summer classes. And I was like, you know what? I should, I should double up on what I got to do. Let me head there and let me register for classes. So I call, you know, uh, don't worry, I have Apple CarPlay. I'm not texting and driving for those of you who are curious. I'm calling and I'm making sure that I have all my registered classes for the summer. And I get to the meeting and I'm kind of halfway on the phone because I'm like, I don't want to hang up. I'm halfway through. I've been on hold. So then I get registered. I'm in mid-conversation walking into this luncheon and I'm kind of looking around, peering around, trying to see if I recognize at least someone. So I go back out, I sign in like my name and my, my like name tag or whatever, and I go back in and I'm kind of like, okay, I have one person that I know here that's going to be here. Are they here? And after five minutes or so, I'm recognizing that I may not be in the right place. But the funny thing is, nobody cared. I was at a random luncheon. I was just strolling around and everybody was like, all right, he's got a name badge. And what I realized from this is that there's a power in a name badge whether that be just a simple Jonathan Toady or John or JT or whatever it is, as soon as you put on a name tag, people let you just walk right in. So I was in a random luncheon. Don't worry, I made it to the right luncheon after I realized that I was at a wrong one. But what I realized in this is that God has not only given us not only a name tag, not only a t-shirt to say, go and fall in line, but he's given us a name. He's called us by name. He's set us apart. He's set us apart in our mother's room for a good work for us to step into so that we can be like the Daniels, the Esthers, the Davids, and the Moseses. There's a power not only in a name tag or a t-shirt, there's a power in us because the kingdom of God dwells within us and the kingdom of God is an ever-present reality. But the thing about this is, as, as you've kind of understood from, from the people that I've listed, many of them had challenges in and, in and of themselves. Many of them were walking through difficult season. Each of the leaders that I've listed were either unprepared, they were imbalanced, or even, think about it, broken, that they weren't perfect people. And there comes a point in time in our spiritual pilgrimage or odyssey, if you will, that God awakens in us some area of imbalance, brokenness, or even impurity. And in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, this is exactly what he was doing. He was writing to a fractionalized Christian group. So look at 1 Corinthians with me, and let's look at chapter 12. It says in verse 12, just as one body through one has many parts, but it is many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Notice how many times it says one. For we, are, we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, in this passage, Paul's putting his finger on a specific issue of crucial significance to holistic spirituality. And Paul implies that our spiritual journey, while it may be unique to us, while we may be unique in our journey the same, each of us as an individual member of the body of Christ is no, is no longer separated, nor are we isolated from the group. 
So, so think of it as like a, a large caravan or convoy. If you've ever been on a journey or if you've been on a trip, right, you stick together. And that's exactly what Paul is referring to, that you are one body in Christ, that although you might come from a different background, you might have a different ethnic uh, background, you might have a social background that doesn't match up with everybody else, you are one body. You're not Jew or Greek or Gentile or Scythian. You are one in Christ. So Paul touches on this vital issue of relationship between individual and the faith community. Individual, you and I, and the church, the body of Christ. And specifically, the relationship of the uniqueness of each individual to the community and the community back to them. So what does that kind of mean? Well, let me break this down again, right? With the metaphor of the body. So you have many different body parts. You have hands, you have feet, you have ears, you have a nose, you have a head, you have a torso, you have legs, and all of those function in one unison, right? Now, Julian, he's maturing and he's growing up and he's getting stronger and he's testing the limits. Today, he was like on his little like climber and I was like, oh my goodness, my wife and I freaked out because we were talking and we were engaging and here he is up on the thing and we're like, ah! So he's learning what it means to walk what it means to crawl, what it means to operate his body in unison. And that's what Christ is calling us to, what Paul is calling us to, to operate in unison, to have the hand, not competing with this hand, but operating together in harmony. And the faith community is not a homogenous collection of individuals that drive the same kind of luxury brand cars or hang out at the same cafe. Really, the the church, there is no distinction. The church should be diverse. The church should not be, you and I, the church, should not be isolated or independent entities operating without any accountability. We are called to be one. So Paul's emphasis on this is a interdependence, not totally dependent on each other, not in, in independent, but interdependent as a faith community. So what does that mean practically for us? Well, each and every one of us are on a spiritual journey, and that spiritual journey includes, and it must include, the church. For us, there is no holistic spirituality for the individual outside of a community of faith. So yes, you might be able to, in our modern day and age, watch church online, do everything online, do everything that you want to do in the comfort of your own home, but church, it is essential for us as the body of Christ to be together. The church exists for us, but also we exist for the church. And also to, in fact, like piggyback off of Paul's imagery, the, the idea that uh, uh, Paul's, individual, Paul's image of the holistic spirituality of the individual is essential for the spiritual wholeness of that individual. So just as the hand needs the body, the body needs the hand. Just as the leg needs the foot, the foot needs the leg. You get the kind of idea that I'm going after. And I think one other uh, idea that we can kind of piggyback off of this is a symbiotic relationship. Now, you know of many different animals that have symbiotic relationships, but I think of bees and flowers. Whereas a bee needs food, the flower needs to reproduce, and both work in harmony to benefit everything. And each and every one of us, although we may be totally different, one of us might be a bee and we have a stinger and we've hurt people and we're still hurting people. Some of us are flowers and we're gentle and we just let people trample all over us. There's harmony in this and there's restoration in it as well. So you and I, individually, we can be whole only through the interdependence of interaction with other members in the church. So that means that we're going to have time to hang out at the end of this if I get through. So pray that I get through this fast, right? So this insight, it provides us with so much context when we're considering the gifts of the Spirit or gifts and preferences, values, virtues, talents, those very personal and, 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 and individual structures of our personality, maybe even our character, really of our being and doing. Each one of us has a different story and each one of us probably has a unique calling, a calling to this, that, or the other, a different calling to our career, a different calling to life. But each of us have, have preferences. And these unique gifts are God's means of grace for the enrichment of the church, for the enrichment of the community that we're a part of, and for even for our world. So think about it, right? If everybody was an accountant, what would the world look like? I mean, we would be very balanced. We'd be very organized. Our closets would probably be color-coordinated, but we would lack some creativity. 
Not to say that all accountants aren't creative, but the general stereotype. What if we were all musicians? We would probably be all over the place, right? A generalization. But what if there were only one type of anything, one type of blank? The diversity in the world is where there is beauty. Think about it with music, think about it with art, think about it with business, think about it with cultural cuisines. It is through our diversity or our diverse gifts and talents that we're able to bring beauty into life. So same thing for the church, right? Mysteriously, it's through our unique, mutual uniqueness that we can operate interdependently to enrich and enhance our growth towards the wholeness of Christ. So each of us operating mutually, independently in our own uniqueness can also in harmony and in unity and in love and in grace and in forgiveness operate together as the body of Christ, enriching it and encouraging the body of Christ to mature and to grow together. So community is not only where your gifts are discovered, community is where your gifts are challenged and your gifts are developed. I'm gonna say that again because that is so good. Community is not only where your gifts are are discovered, so it's not a place where you come and you're just like, all right, let's just try this out. No, it's a place where you grow and you mature from those who are ahead of you in season and, and also those who are behind you in season. And you discover your gifts and then also your gifts are challenged and also then uh, developed. So think about the diversity uh, in, in, in all of life, right? But specifically, also keep in mind diversity in personalities. Now, if I were to do a personality assessment, which I love personality assessments, I'm a huge nerd on this. Uh, in college, I was like a Myers-Briggs like fanatic, and then I kind of matured into the Enneagram because it's more Christian. But if I were to do an, a personality test, there would be so many diverse people and perspectives and personalities represented here tonight. And the beauty of, is, of that is that we are all different people. Some of us are extroverts, introverts, referencing the, the Myers-Briggs. Some of us are sensing people. Some of us are intuitive people. Some of us are thinking kind of people. We're like more rational. Some of us are like, we have an intuitive hit. We feel it. We're going to go with it, right? Some of us are more judgers, more perceptive people. And then also with the Enneagram, there's 18 different types of personalities that you can not be. You can't be all 18, but there's 18 combinations or variations that you can have. And all these personalities and personality traits are essentially gifts that we've, we've been equipped with, that the Lord has created us in His image, in His likeness, and given us to edify the church. Now, I might call them preferences, whereas other authors call them creation gifts, but our preferred modes of employing these gifts have been developed all throughout life. Now, if you were to ask me how I was when I was a kid, I would have told you that I was not the type of person that wanted to be up here. I was not the type of person that wanted to be somebody who learned something and then taught others. I was like, I'm the backseat kind of dude. I'm like the younger sibling complex. Somebody else is going to do it. But the Lord has matured me. And in this process, I begin to grow in the gifts and the talents that he's imparted and instilled in me. And that's exactly what the church is for, to discover and to develop our gifts. Now, some of us, we have preference, we have gifts, we have virtues, we have values, we have different things that we've adopted along the way that make up our personality. But some of us, we have clear and cl clear cut and delineated preferences, right? Now, on a lighter note, some of us prefer McDonald's, some of us prefer Whataburger. I'm more in this camp, right? Some of us prefer Bluebell. Some of us, haagen -Dazs. Any haagen -Dazs people? Come on. Yes, I heard, some, I heard someone over here. Some of us prefer... 1967 Corvette to a 18 or 1989 Ferrari. But in our, in our present reality, we have the option of choosing the best of both worlds, whether it's McDonald's or this type of car. But our personalities are either clear cut or even sometimes concealed. And some people, the, our preferences aren't just simple tastes, but they're really the way that we interact and interact in relationships is also with also the world. So our, our preferences, our character, our personality is, is more impactful than we think. It impacts not only just our taste in this or that or the other, but it impacts our interpersonal relationships, our social skills, our, our developmental skills, our career, our decision making. It impacts a host of different things. But however our preferences 
come from, whether they are discovered by the Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or our friends or our family, they're not a straight jacket for us to live in. And I think that oftentimes in our cultural moment, many people have set their personality, set their trajectory, set their career, set their next move based on something online, based on something that somebody else has told them, based on something that might, might not come from Scripture. So I want to encourage you that your personality is not a straight jacket that you live in. It's not that your horoscope is this and you have to do this. It's not that your teachers or your parents said you have to be this. It's not a straight jacket for you to live in, but nor is it the Bible. It's not this or it's not that. It's something that we can both use, but it's also abused. So it's simply, I would say, psychological observations at best that help us discover who we are deep down in our inner parts of our being. Now, when we're talking about spiritual formation, we have to talk about gifts, we have to talk about preferences, we have to talk about who we are. Now, if you're getting ahead of me, you're kind of like thinking, okay, he's talking about spiritual gifts, I'm an Enneagram type one, or I'm in a Myers-Briggs this, that, or the other. I'm definitely a leader, I'm Dwight Schrute on the Myers-Briggs. I hate that, I absolutely hate that, but, for you, you're like, oh, I want to be the head. If we're referencing the body, right? I'm going to be the head. I don't want to be the hands. I don't want to be the feet. I have a bad back, so I'm just going to be the head. I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to tell people what to do. Now, before you get ahead of yourself, remember, Christ is the head of the church, right? That's exactly what it says in Colossians 1:18. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church. So instead of us being the head, what body part do we want to be? Well, that's not necessarily what Paul is alluding to or what Scripture is referencing here. It's really an illustration for us to understand and to be able to visualize what he's referring to, that we don't have a specific job, but we are each gifted in unique ways with the freedom to discover and grow in those gifts. Now, for Jesus, you don't have to have all your gifts in order or developed or matured to step into ministry. I certainly didn't have it. You should have seen me when I was starting out in TYA. You definitely didn't want to come hear me talk then. But as we mature, we grow in those gifts. And so that's a calling for somebody here tonight, for somebody that might be watching, that you don't have to be perfect before you step into the kingdom of God. That much like many of the other leaders that I was listening, list, listing, they were imbalanced, broken, and even imperfect and impure. Jesus said in the gospel, he said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. It's as simple as this, that as you step into ministry, you can give Jesus a drink of water. As I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, I was in prison, and you visited me. So what do we do unto the least of those, or unto the least of these, those on the fringes of society, it is honoring to God. And then also, this is echoed so much throughout Scripture. Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, As each has received a gift, so each and every one of us here tonight has received a gift, each of us receiving a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I think that one of the inherent qualities of being made in the image and likeness of God is that each of us have talents, have gifts, have preferences, have abilities, and some of us might be proficient over here while others are more handy over here, but it doesn't mean that right-handed people are called and equipped. It doesn't mean that left-handed people are called and equipped. It means that God is calling those who want and are willing to surrender their will to serve in the kingdom of God, to be a part of the mission of God. And rather than just prioritizing this is better than this, it's rather surrendering whatever we are, whether it's surrendering our head, surrendering our heart, or surrendering our hands, we are called, whatever comfort level or preference we have, to surrender our gifts, our talents, and our abilities. And as we surrender them, that's when we learn that God is calling us and he's equipping us as he calls us to step into not only our life, but to step into others' lives. Now, this is the difficulty, right? When you give people responsibility, it's like Uncle Ben, right? With great power comes great responsibility, right? So when you get a gift, when the Lord gives you something, he expects you to be mature and responsible with that. 
Like the story in the parable where he gave the talents away. He didn't expect the servants to hide them and to bury them, but to double them, to be good stewards of them. And this is the problem where people get a gift and they become bloated, they become arrogant, and they don't use it the right way. And that's exactly what Paul was referencing to and correcting with the Corinthians. And I think that it's also our tendency, whether you recognize it or not, I'll be honest, I've even done it as well. So let me be the first, and you can follow after my lead, of admitting to your wrong. I think that our view and our tendency is to view our own preference as the de facto mode or the default or the right and normal way. I know that some of you might be able to relate to that. We expect others to kind of conform to our norm, that I'm thinking this way, so obviously I'm right. That's like 90% of marital arguments, right? And then also, alter- alternatively, we kind of think about, oh man, they might be right. Let me kind of default to them. Let me just, let me relate to them that way. Let me respond to life as they would. But I think even worse than both of those perspectives is that we begin to have the tendency that our view, or our view is right, but also everybody else's view, or gifts, or talents, or patterns of preference are maybe even unusual or wrong. And then, of course, one of the marks of maturity, as described in Romans and even in Corinthians, is the the ability to think openly about the gifts that are in the church. So I want you to look around for just a second. Look to your right, look to your left. And each person that is here tonight represents a gift that God has instilled in the church for you to enact in, to endeavor in, to practice, to mature in, so that way you edify Christ. Now, oftentimes, we we try to do it on our own, right? We try to do the devotionals. We try to do the worship songs. We try to go to this, that, and the other. But again, spiritual formation isn't doing more. It's actually doing less. It's allowing God to work in our being, to work in our order, to work in our doing, so that way we can become more like Him rather than just workers or or, or, um, uh, employees for the kingdom of God. So we start to think highly of ourselves rather than embracing the gifts that are around us, rather than uh, uh, encouraging the gifts around us. We kind of think about, oh, my gift is better than their gift. Now, if you think about it, many of us have uh, probably been in this situation where you've been on a bus and that bus was headed towards a camp for church or maybe even a school event. Uh, you're going towards a field trip or you're going towards a, a baseball game or a basketball game or a cheerleading thing. You have one section of the bus and then you have the other section of the bus, right? You have the front section of the bus and then you have the back section of the bus. The back section, se- session, section, there we go. The back section of the bus is usually more of the not rowdy, but the louder and the front is the quieter. Now, in our perspective of the church, there are some people who are on the front row, who are ready to get it, who are here every time, who are here serving, and then there's some on the back row. And that doesn't mean that one is better than the other, but we are the body of Christ, here to encourage, here to develop, here to mature as one body. And if one body part hurts, what do we do? We help and we surround and we encourage. Now, I think that uh, I'm, I'm probably not alone in this, but... I've often forgot what certain body parts do, right? You're like, when you're pinky, you're like, do I even use my pinky? Or like your, your, like your pinky toe or whatever. You don't realize what you do with that said body part until you damage or injure it, right? So if you like stub your toe on the coffee table or if you stub your toe on the bed frame, mm, it hurts, right? And then you're like, oh, that's what my pinky does. Every time I step, my toes are balancing my whole weight. And so now I understand that I have to walk with a limp in order to, you know, heal that. And I think that what we can learn from this example is that we as the body of Christ, when one person hurts, we all hurt. When one person is imbalanced, we are all imbalanced. And the beauty of that is, yes, it is gonna require a little bit more work, but the beauty of that is that we share each other's burdens. We're not isolated, we're not individuals kind of doing our own thing. We come to church and we let that person do their own spiritual journey. But we are here, consistent, faithful to one another because we are the body of Christ. We are not people who follow the church. We're not people who follow a pastor. We are the body of Christ. 
And scripture has not been lost to the sands of time. Scripture is something that we meditate on day and night to be, like the psalmist, the person on the righteous path. And our uniqueness, our mutual uniqueness, it's, it's, uh, it's allowing us to operate interdependently so that we, we can encourage, we can grow together, we can mature together, and we can develop the gifts and the callings that Christ has for us. Russell D. Moore, he says it more poetically. He says, in the New Testament, we don't find our gift through self-examination or introspection. No, and then we find ways to express it. That's not how we do it. Instead, we love one another we serve one another, we help one another, and in doing so, we see how God has equipped us to do so. There's so much to be said about that. That each person that's here up on the worship team, as they have applied themselves, they are doing just a little thing here, a little thing there, a little thing there, and before you know it, they're up on platform leading you in worship. So you and I, we're called to do the same. And we not, may, may not be called to be the hand or the foot. We might not be called to be the worship leader or the accountant, but God has called each and every one of us. And maybe you're in a season where you've forgotten your gifts, you've forgotten your talents. You're like, Jonathan, I do not know where to start. Don't worry, God knows. God knows each and every gift, each and every talent, each and every ability that he's put in you. Why? Because he's put it in there for a purpose to edify the church, to build up the kingdom, and at the same time, build you up and encourage you. And so I wanna read Colossians 3. Uh, we're gonna read through verse 17 as we close out tonight, just as an encouragement to the body of Christ. I think that I could say, I could stay up here for another 10 minutes, I don't have to, but what I wanna do is I wanna read scripture over you. I think there's, there's so much truth and power and insight and wisdom and knowledge in scripture and as we the body of christ we should be encouraged by scripture so let this be something that rests over you tonight colossians 3 it says if then you have been raised with christ which we have seek the things that are above where christ is seated at the right hand of god set your mind not on the things that are here present right in front of us but no set them on the things that are above us not on the things that are on the earth for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So put away the old patterns of self. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Judgment will come. Repent, as Jesus said. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you, you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Again, be one, united. Seeing that you have put off the old self, that's our language right there, the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, in Trinity, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, as the nation of God, as holy people, as ambassadors for Christ. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Here's a template for us to follow. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, there's something in this list for each and every one of us to work on, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint, a complaint against one, one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, if there's one thing that you should prioritize in your life, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs like we did tonight and we do every weekend with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. That's so good. Well, church family, can we stand together? Again, on spiritual formation, I know that it's not a, a flattering 
practice. It's not a flattering uh, engagement. The, the image that we've chosen is really a basic uh, uh, image because it speaks of the practice of spiritual formation. When you dive into what the Lord has for you, oftentimes it's a purgation. It's purging out some of the things that might be overstimulating or distracting you like in the words of Martha. So for you tonight, my encouragement to you is to press into what the Lord has for you. Remember that spiritual transformation is not something that we do to ourselves, but it's something that the Lord does unto us. So let's pray us out tonight as we depart. So Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for what it represents. Lord, we stand as the body of Christ. We don't stand as an individual that comes to church, but we stand as a collective body, the church that you have established. And we understand that, Lord, that there is a process of sanctification. And that process, Lord, you have begun it and you will bring it into completion. So, Lord, I pray for those who might be, have been backslidden, those who might be uh, needing encouragement, those who might be down tonight. I pray that you would fill us up, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, and that you would invite us into a new depth, a new relationship, a new renewal of our spirit that we would be able to be strengthened, encouraged, lifted up, to be able to operate in the gifts and the talents that you have instilled in us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen.